Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. We've got the last in our series of Art Talk lectures about the WPA and the Federal Art Collection, and we've got Devin Coleman who's going to be speaking tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about Devin. Devin is the Vermont State Architectural Historian, and he's been with the state since 2006, is that right? About there. And he really, his heart is really highlighting a lot of the buildings and sites that we ignore quite a bit and don't notice, and he's going to certainly talk about some of those tonight. But his interest is really in mid-20th century modern architecture. And uh, he and his family live in a historic 1956 ranch house. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really pleased to have him tonight, so let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Jenny, for having me here tonight. Yeah. And I have to admit, I kind of invited myself to, to speak at this series. <laughs> he said, oh, you're doing this exhibit. Can I talk? Because I, yes. I have heard about this WPA art collection for years and known that it was here at the Wood Gallery and always wanted to see it. And I emailed Ginny this summer and said, can I just come over and just look and just see the, the artwork? And she said, well, it's going on display next month. So can you wait four weeks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then it got me thinking that this would be a great opportunity to do some research and put together a presentation on the murals that were done during the New Deal, because obviously these works of art do not travel. Um, they are in place. Um, so whereas here we have a great collection of uh, artwork that can be <coughs> displayed in, in a gallery setting, for these murals, you really need to get out and go to the buildings to see them. So uh, to start out, um, I'd like to talk about every New Deal program that was ever developed. And, uh, there, are, there are dozens of programs. And trying to sort these things out is pretty much impossible. But <laughs> while researching these, uh, these works of art and trying to figure out, OK, was this a WPA project or a treasury section project? Um, even contemporary sources written in the 1930s, you know, when a program ended, they would do a government uh, review and report, and even those reports mixed up the acronyms. They mislabeled things. I mean, it was there were so many programs and so many administrations and departments, and then subprograms under those. It's really tough to sort them out. But I, I did <laughs> did the best I could. They're ah. typically referred to as WPA murals because the WPA was one of the longest running and the most visible programs of the New Deal. So any kind of artwork just sort of automatically gets lumped in with WPA. The murals that we'll be looking at are all from the Treasury Department, uh, which oversaw the construction and uh, decoration of public buildings at the time. So, uh, and you'll hear me refer to the section. That was the Treasury Department. Uh, section of painting and sculpture, and it known uh, just shorthand as the section. For example, the confusion, there's the Works Progress Administration, which then became the Works Pro Projects Administration. Yeah. Two different programs, same acronym, very similar missions, but they are a little different. And those are the programs that funded the federal art projects that created the collections that we have on display here at the Wood Gallery. And all of these art programs, especially the murals, uh, really grew out of the intersection of, of the patron, which was the federal government, uh, <coughs> the painter, the artist creating the work, and the public. There was a lot of public interaction with the creation of these murals and deciding the subject matter and who would be painting it to varying degrees. Different programs had different levels of public interaction, but that was always a, one of the goals of the program was to make this public art for the people. And we have to remember that the 1930s, this was a time when the average American was not exposed to real original works of art routinely. You know, maybe a portrait of the benefactor for the public library you know, hanging in the, above the mantle in the library. That might be an original piece of work the average American would see. Uh, the museum culture we have today, uh, most of those big collections that we can see now were still in private hands in the 1930s. 
So it wasn't part of the everyday life of the average American to see original works of art. And a big part of the, the New Deal, which is, is so fantastic, you know, government funding for artists, you know, paying them to do their work instead of having them laboring in a factory or doing something else, you know, let them do what they're good at, develop their skills, and at the same time develop a national art collection, which we have a portion of here, and then also permanently install uh, public works of art, original works of art, in public buildings, so that even though people weren't going to museums, they were certainly going to the post office, and there's a, an original work of art that you could enjoy. And I think that's really, uh, really says a lot about the, the New Deal art programs, that emphasis on getting art to the people. We also have to think about the context of the artistic world at the time, 1930s. Uh, this is certainly when the early modernist movement is taking off in the art world, uh, balanced by the regionalist art movement. And uh, paintings like this by John Stuart Curry, Baptism in Kansas, uh, hearkening back to this kind of ideal Midwest, Deep South, idyllic, you know, the good old days on the farm, back to our roots type imagery. And uh, this was really very popular around the country. It, it was, you know, it's accessible. It's, you, the average person can understand, appreciate, and enjoy this picture. It's not some strange abstraction where you have to know where the artist is coming from and what they're thinking. You know, this is relatively understandable work. Uh, another Stuart Curry, um, Our Good Earth, uh, an example of kind of that, that heroic farmer figure that turns up in a lot of these New Deal murals. You know, the strong, stern farmer in the, the, uh, the wheat fields and just a classic you know, American, strength of America type imagery. And Thomas Hart Benton, of course, this is sort of the, the trifecta, John Stuart Curry. <laughs> Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood. Uh, they were the big regionalist painters in the, in the country. And Benton is very interesting for his, he's showing these, these typical rural scenes, gathering the wheat, cradling the wheat, but very distorted and uh, yeah. almost uh, not cartoonish, but almost the, his landscapes just sort of roll and boil and his trees come up, so he's certainly uh, not simply doing an illustration, he's really taking an artistic approach, but <coughs> the subject matter is definitely kind of the heartland, the Midwest. Grant Wood, um, in, in contrast to Thomas Hart Benton, I mean, this is the most perfectly planted corn <laughs> <laughs> you will ever find in the geometry. It's really just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Grant Wood also going back to the heartland, the Midwest. And I'm from Minnesota originally. I mean, I grew up with these paintings all over the place. And it's not quite that perfect. But Obsessive <laughs> compulsive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so that was where a lot of the, uh, a big part of the art world was focused was on this regionalist approach to artwork. At the same time, there was also a very strong uh, continuation of the illustration uh, historical narrative uh, by artists such as N.C. Wyeth, Norman Rockwell, Howard Pyle. Uh, these were the, the artists doing the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. You know, this was another, uh, if people weren't seeing original works of art, they were at least getting uh, the covers of the Saturday Evening Post and seeing those paintings, maybe a calendar with a picture reproduced on it. Um, so there was some exposure to art, but not original art. And of course, we can't talk about murals in the 30s without bringing up Diego Rivera, mm -hmm. Rockefeller Center, and the, the fiasco over his uh, mural, which was not a government New Deal mural. This was a private commission by the Rockefeller family. Um, hired uh, Rivera to paint a mural in the lobby of Rockefeller Center. They did not like when he inserted Lenin in part of it and an unflattering picture of uh, John D. Rockefeller in another part as the aristocrat, aristocrat uh, gazing over the workers. And it was destroyed. This was big news at the time and big controversy. 
and you really can't escape talking about murals without having this in the back of your mind. The government did not want this sort of fiasco on their hands. <laughs> so <laughs> there was definitely a push uh, with when selecting proposals for murals to prioritize historical narrative and portraits, to emphasize depictions of the American scene, that rural heartland <coughs> comes up again and again, and portrayers, portrayals of the worker, the, the ideal American uh, striving to do their best, and ideally all three. In one, if you could get all three in one mural, you were, you were going to get that commission. <laughs> it's certainly nothing controversial. No, no political statements, uh, no leftist-leaning uh, ideology. These are straightforward uh, art for the people. So let's look at our first uh, building here, and this is the the Rutland Post Office, and this is a major building in Rutland. Uh, this was a, a big deal when this went up in 1931. It actually houses the post office and the courthouses uh, for Rutland, and it has the most extensive uh, collection of murals out of any of the buildings uh, that we'll be looking at. These were all funded through the Treasury, uh, Treasury Relief Art Project, um, and the murals are monumental. Uh, these are on the side uh, four feet wide and 11 feet high. Uh, so these are really, you know, you can't go in this lobby and not see these murals. <laughs> you know, no. They are right there. And with the, uh, the depiction here, we, this is really picking up on the historical narrative theme of uh, tradition and art. Uh, of the, the NCYF type sort of illustrative uh, American style of illustration. And what we have here is a, a scene with Ethan Allen on the left, some of his Green Mountain Boys <coughs> gathering ranks in the middle, and on the right, a Yorker uh, sort of raising his fist. He wants to get his, his land grant um, <coughs> back from the New Hampshire, get his, his patent from the New Hampshire grants. and. What's interesting is that these are, uh, the artist did some research. Stephen Belaski is the artist on this and incorporated details like something I had never heard of, the beach seal. Mm -hmm. And this was apparently a, a form of corporal punishment that the uh, Green Mountain Boys would threaten to administer to the Yorkers where if you look at this figure here, he's holding a branch and this man back here is holding a branch, and they're approaching the Yorker here, uh, essentially to beat him <laughs> with this beech wow. branch and picking up on the, the tree that was in the seal of the New Hampshire grants and saying they would, you know, they'll put a seal on any Yorker by beating him, essentially, <laughs> with tree branches. So little historical tidbits like that. Um, I think it's really interesting that the artist did the research to incorporate that uh, in the work of art. Another painting in Rutland, uh, this is the Green Mountain Boys gathering at the Breckenridge Farm to fight off the sheriff from Albany who was coming with 300 men to stake their claim and they were uh, encouraged to go back home <laughs> by, the, by the Green Mountain Boys. And uh, another uh, eight and a half feet wide by 11 feet high. Uh, this painting depicts uh, freeing the first slave in the state of Vermont. And this apparently tells the story of uh, Captain Ebenezer Allen of Bennington reading an official certificate of emancipation for Dinah Mattis and her child who were found on a British uh, baggage train of some sort and then emancipated. I know that from the wall text at this mural. Try Googling that name, uh, uh, Dynamatis, nothing. I do not know if the story is actually true <laughs> or if it was, it's nothing that I have come across before. It was before the Vermont Constitution was written, so I think there's a little more uh, research to be done there. But certainly playing up in these murals, the the pride in Vermont history and going back to the, the founding days of the state. 
And the final uh, painting, uh, we've got Benedict Arnold commanding the uh, first battle on his ship, the Royal Savage, on Lake Champlain. Very heroic, you know, billowing smoke and billowing sails, and uh, this sword at the ready, and his men loading the cannons. And it should be, yeah, very similar. This this painting by N.C. Wyatt actually postdates uh, this one in Rutland, but they were drawing from the same sources of imagery and composition and you know knowing what people wanted to see the, the drama in these works now we move on to white river junction another <coughs> uh, major building right in the heart of white river junction right on main street and what's great is that this building is now uh, the lower level is the library for the center for cartoon studies mm -hmm. so even though it's not a post office you can still go in and just poke your head in the door. You can see the, uh, the mural up on the wall. The artist was S. Uh, Douglas Crockwell, 1937. And this is another uh, work that came out of the section. And Spencer Douglas Crockwell uh, was born in Ohio, studied in St. Louis and Chicago, settled in Glens Falls, New York, and also did murals uh, in Endicott, New York, and Macon, Mississippi. You'll see a lot of these New Deal artists uh, would enter multiple competitions, and I think once they kind of got the hang of it, they would be awarded multiple commissions. Uh, you'll hear sometimes the term painting section, meaning these artists, they were smart. <laughs> they knew what the committees were looking for. They knew what to present in their sketch, that, okay, a little bit of history, a little bit of you know heroic workers, all right, good, send uh, maybe a local building, send it in you have a much better chance of getting the work. And that's ultimately what this was all about, was employing uh, artists. It's great. Uh, we actually have the granddaughter of Douglas Crockwell with us here in the audience. <laughs> and <coughs> Megan is, is here. And Megan's mother, Johanna Crockwell, probably about 15 years ago, uh, sent our office a whole packet of photocopies of things like letters to Douglas um, explaining the fee for the mural. You know, this is straight from the agents, from the Treasury Department, and photographs of him painting the mural. Um, it's really a great package of first-hand documentation of what went into these murals and how they came about. And the mural that he created, I think, is really one of the most interesting uh, that we have in that it, it takes this very free-form approach. Almost all the other murals, but both in Vermont and around the country, they, f they completely fill the rectangular frame with the cutout for the door, um, but they paint right to the edges, uh, use all the canvas. Whereas Crockwell creates this um, very interesting composition uh, in which a river running down the middle spreads out to the sides, it fills in a little quarry here, then it goes up sort of blends up into the edges to become the sky as the backdrop for the mural. And in this case, Crockwell laid out three distinct units uh, in the mural. The first uh, honoring the, the quarrying in Vermont, that great history that we have. And again, really picking up on the details. You see the worker here, and you can see he's, he's pounding into the rock uh, using the plug and feather method. This is how they quarried stone, where a hole is drilled, two feathers are placed in, and then a, uh, a wedge is pounded in between, and the force would split the rock apart. So either he had knowledge of how quarrying was done or did his research and incorporated that uh, into the artwork. So really an effort to show reality, you know, real life. This is how it was done. It wasn't uh, big fancy machines and saws. It was a man with a hammer <laughs> pounding. And in the center section, uh, let's see, you can see part of it here. It's basically a, just a, a rolling field homage to Vermont farmland with a tractor and a little farmhouse. It's a, a basic idyllic farm scene. And on the right hand side, we have what's uh, sort of the go-to regionalist scene for Vermont, maple sugaring. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
um, this was really what the artist latched onto as the perfect Vermont scene. We will, we'll see a lot more of it. In St. Albans, uh, this was a post office and customs house, another major building for, for St. Albans. It, other than Rutland, uh, these buildings aren't being built in major population centers. <laughs> They're you know, a little more far flung. And uh, this work, another uh, work from the section. And the artist Philip von Salza uh, was an interesting guy. He was actually from Sweden. And a lot of the New Deal artists were actually immigrants. And I think there had to have been some, some pride in having, especially for Salza, who, as you see, uh, fought for the United States in World War I, was a prisoner of war. Uh, when he finally got back, he began a, began a career as an artist. And it must have been pretty satisfying for him to be hired by the United States government to create a work of art for a, a public building, you know, an official US government building as an immigrant, as a veteran. Um, I think that must have been pretty, uh, pretty rewarding for him. And he also did murals in New Hampshire, Nebraska, and North Carolina. So the two, there are two murals that Salsa did in St. Albans. And unfortunately, I don't believe you can see them. Uh, the building is not a post office anymore. It's used by uh, immigration services largely, possibly by appointment if you call ahead. Um, but it's not a, lot, a post office lobby that's open on a regular basis. <coughs> uh, but the murals look great. Unlike Crockwell's work in White River Junction, where he had three distinct scenes, um, this is one complete scene, a farm scene uh, with small vignettes of the workers loading the hay and uh, the farmer at the barn, the dancers in the front, the boy playing the fiddle, and the housewife, the, the mother of the, the house overlooking everything, and just a really idyllic Vermont scene. And this was, this was what they wanted for New Deal post offices, just very nice, um, very nicely executed. I think, feel like there's a lot of, a lot of energy in the brushstrokes here, um, these dancers and the, the fluid depiction of the hay sort of lumped up. Um, really a nice work. And so this is on one end of the lobby, and facing it at the other end is the winter scene. Mm -hmm. It's maple sugaring. <laughs> and so here we have a, a full look um, of the process of sugaring, uh, from gathering the buckets uh, to dumping them into the larger uh, bucket to be pulled over to the sugar shack and boiled. And then the associated, you know, kids having a snowball fight, the dog playing in the snow, and these are pretty contemporary scenes. You see the automobiles, you know, they're not looking back to the 1800s. This is a pretty contemporary 1930s uh, scene that he's depicting. Now, Northfield, uh, this was uh, interesting. I talked to a woman who lives not far from here, and said she goes to the post office all the time. And I said, oh, I'm going to go take pictures of the mural. What mural? <laughs> <laughs> the giant, like, 14 foot wide, eight foot tall <laughs> mural above the lobby. Nope, never seen it. And it's just, there's, I think it, after a while, we just forget to look. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. I'm sure next time she will look. Um, but Charles Doherty uh, did actually one large mural and three smaller ones, which are interesting, um, in the Northfield Post Office. I could find nothing out about this artist, um, other than his father was a very famous mural painter, um, who also did some New Deal murals. But actually, the one photo I, the one photo that I could find here, is actually Charles posing for a painting that his dad is doing. <laughs> so. Um, really not a lot of information about his life and career and where he studied. But the mural is fantastic. Um, it's a single subject, and it's all about this newfangled hobby of downhill skiing. And we're in the late 30s. Um, this is when the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, they're still cutting the first ski trails on Mount Mansfield. So downhill skiing at this time was not skiing <laughs> as it is today. This is, you know, big, heavy skis, uh, wearing your boots, uh, no quick release bindings. Uh, this was, you're hiking up the mountain and you're skiing down. 
Um, and I just love compositionally this center figure forming a, a focal point, triangular focal point with the skis sort of akimbo, really taking into account the fact that there's a big door <laughs> and he's sort of trying to stop right above it. Um, and, you know, there's some humor in these paintings. There's, you know, this guy's falling down and trying to help him up. And um, it's a, kind of a glimpse of real life, real Vermont life. Why no shirt? How can he get away with no shirt? <laughs> but down here? Yeah. It, it, he, I think that's just the fabric. Yeah. yeah. So Doherty also did three medallions, you know, octagonal. I, I don't know why they're this shape, why they're not just square or round. Um, but three of these inset above the post office boxes. And one, again, maple sugaring, uh, the, the woodsman out in the wood and out in the forest gathering the sap with the sugar shack in the background. And, you know, Here's a heroic farmer. Look at the size of that foot. You know, this, guy is, this guy is serious. And, you know, the bounty of the harvest, the, the pumpkins and gourds and corn, and, you know, this is the Vermont farmer making a go of it in the midst of the Great Depression. The, the sun in the background, really a, a classic heroic portrait. And then finally, uh, in a direct homage to Northfield, a uh, granite carver. Northfield had a long history of... Uh, with the granite industry, um, but again, this is a this is a contemporary depiction. There's a truck right outside, 1930s truck, a telephone pole. So again, they're showing present day scenes, sort of in this this veil of of old timiness. But, but this was what life was like at that time. Now in Woodstock, um, a female artist, Bernadine Custer, uh, did a mural here. 1940, another section mural. And there's a great collection of papers from Custer at the University of Vermont Special Collections Department um, that includes a lot of the original uh, prospectuses that were sent to artists to uh, for new competitions, telling them what to submit, how to submit, when to submit it, and then follow-up publications saying, here are the winners, and here's where they'll be doing their murals, uh, letters back and forth with the government, and photographs. So this is uh, Bernadine at her home in Landgrove, Vermont, and really a wonderful signature, Custer, all the way up with a T here, um, 1939. And she also painted a mural for Somerville, South Carolina. So they were, they were getting all over the country to do these projects. And we have the sketch that was submitted uh, for this mural. This is the type of sketch, uh, you know, a small scale sketch that would be submitted to the committee for review saying, this is what I propose to do, this is uh, what I'm showing. And she was uh, really pretty spot on with the final work. And the title is The Cycle of Development of Woodstock. And here she, she goes back, uh, similar to what we saw at White River Junction, with, with really three, sort of a left, a center, and a right uh, vignette. Um, on the left, we have the early settlers, a pioneer cabin, and coming in with their wagons and oxen, and you know, taming the forest, the virgin land, the first settlers coming in. And in the center, we have this uh, quartet of men, and these were supposedly all founders of Woodstock, and only one actually was. <laughs> so I don't know what research was done. <laughs> so the first one uh, circled here is Hosea Ballou, a universalist preacher, and known as the, the father of universalism in, in the United States. He was born in New Hampshire, uh, but he did work in the Woodstock area as an itinerant preacher around 1801 to 1807, and did some of his most influential writings while he was uh, in Woodstock. So I suspect that's why he's included, but he was not a native son of Woodstock. Next we have Jacob Colomer, a lawyer, politician, and postmaster general under President Taylor. Uh, he was born in Troy, New York, <laughs> but he did at least spend the last 30 years of his life in Woodstock, so he's got a good good legacy there. 
Uh, finally, John Cotton Dana, uh, renowned library and museum director. He was born in Woodstock, so he's the native son. And in fact, the Dana family house is now the Woodstock Historical Society. So a very, very close connection with the Dana family and Woodstock. And finally, the last figure on the far left uh, is a represents the generic farmer, you know, just sort of the everyman. And you can see him uh, holding his uh, scythe. And what's interesting is these these figures are all placed very deliberately below buildings, uh, but not the buildings in Woodstock, surprisingly. Uh, for example. Uh, the columnar, the lawyer, this is not the Woodstock courthouse. It's sort of a, a generic courthouse. Uh, same as the church, this is not the Universalist church in Woodstock. Um, so not always perfectly true uh, to what was actually in the landscape, but a, a, good, a good effort. And finally, one of my favorite little scenes, we have the golfer. And the downhill skier. <laughs> Who knew <laughs> that you could do both? And this is really looking at present day and future Woodstock um, recreation. You know, Woodstock was uh, was already known as sort of a vacation destination, and they want to emphasize that uh, with the the golfing, the skiing. We have a hunter back here, a hiker, little backpack on, some horseback riders, a little rustic cabin and most notably, a gas pump and an automobile. <laughs> this gas pump caused some little stir in town from what I've read that people did not think that was appropriate to have a gas pump representing Woodstock. What, you know, what was this artist <laughs> thinking? But she wanted to show the present day, and that, that was the reality. <clears throat> now the last mural uh, in Island Pond I've never seen, I guarantee none of you have seen it, because it was never done, <laughs> but it was planned. And there's actually a great story um, behind it. Uh, Bars Miller was the artist, and actually I think there's one or two pieces by Bars on display in the, the collection here. Uh, he was really a California painter, a watercolorist, um, but he came out to Vermont in 1939, uh, 1940, taught at UVM in the summer art program. And that's the same time when Life Magazine was running what they called the 48 States Competition to solicit entries uh, for uh, one mural for one post office in every single state at the time. And there's a very telling quote in this article summarizing the contest. It says, apparently rural Americans are artistic stay-at-homes with a preference for paintings that reproduce experiences and scenes and parts of history with which they are familiar. Kind of a dig, <laughs> but it's kind of true also. Um, they, they were not looking for bold, wild abstractions. Um, significantly, the much publicized Main Street atmosphere of small towns does not seem to mean so much to the people who actually <laughs> live in them, <laughs> which is true. There are no paintings of the classic downtown, you know, village center in Vermont with a town green and a church and a general store, and they just don't show up. They're more uh, focused on people, you know, workers, um, or landscapes, you know, the, the farm scene. This was the winning entry for uh, the Island Pond Post Office in the 48 States competition. Uh, and it explains here in the work of Bars Miller, the Californian, one may always expect to find a decided sense of the monumental. And that's what they wanted in these paintings. He has discarded previously favored allegorical figures for a more outright reflection of American life. And, you know, this is it. You know, these are the, the two sort of faceless workers, big, strong guys working at the sawmill in the lumber yard in Island Pond. And if you've been to Island Pond, you're going to recognize this building for sure. That's the Grand Trunk Railroad Station. And you can certainly see the tower here, the chimneys. So Bars Miller definitely went to Island Pond to create this. And the other piece, uh, this is the town, the opera house in Town Hall right here. And there was a large railroad yard and roundhouse, which is no longer present, uh, but was there at the time. And of course, 
island pond in the background. Now, at the same time, Paul Sample, yeah. who was artist in residence at Dartmouth for mm -hmm. decades, um, he created a proposal for Island Pond. And somehow this was awarded the winning prize for the post office in Westerly, Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a case where that, you know, government, artist, public interaction didn't work. <laughs> somehow, somehow this sketch was awarded to Westerly, Rhode Island, and when they saw it, they said, we don't have an overpass at our <laughs> what, what is this? We don't know where this is. The public wanted a local scene. And there's a, a great debate back and forth. Eventually, this mural was scrapped, and actually, Westerly and, and Island Pond, the post offices were never even built. So those were, it was really a 46 state competition. Um, but there, there was supposed to be one more mural in Vermont, but uh, never done. So the murals today. Um, fortunately, of the five that were done, uh, <coughs> they are all intact. They're all in their original places. Um, and generally, you know, I didn't do a fine inspection of all of them, but they appear to be in pretty decent condition, largely because they're up high on the walls. They're a good seven or eight feet above the floor level, out of the risk of getting dinged with mail carts and people leaning against them and so on. So they're, they're pretty well protected. And they're also uh, interior uh, with very little uh, direct light shining on them. So they're pretty well preserved. Let's see, I'm not sure about the ones in Rutland, but all the others are painted on canvas that's then uh, attached directly to the wall surface. Um, so they're not, it's not a stretched canvas with a risk of puncture. Um, but like I mentioned before, probably the biggest threat is just our amazing ability to not see things. And they're right there. And maybe you acknowledged it 20 years ago when you first went to the building, but now it's just, it's always been there. It'll always be there. So, you know, really making sure that people are aware of what these murals are, what they represent, where they came from, I think is really important. Now, shifting into buildings, you know, murals were great, because there are five. <laughs> the building programs uh, and projects done in Vermont, uh, there's no, will barely scratch the surface. Um, there were so many projects, so many different entities involved. Um, but the three main bodies doing uh, building projects in the state were the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Public Works Administration, and the Resettlement Administration, they did not do any projects in Vermont. So really the, the first two were the ones doing work in Vermont. The Resettlement Administration is best known for its green towns, Greenbelt, Maryland, Greendale, uh, let's see, Greendale, Wisconsin, and Green Hills, Ohio, these planned communities resettling entire uh, communities into new houses. So with the Civilian Conservation Corps, you know, basically at least 50% of our state parks we owe to the CCC, and the work they did was phenomenal, including Mount Mansfield uh, cutting the first trail up the mountain, uh, putting in the ski lifts and tow ropes, and building uh, the first base lodge. And this is the uh, Mount Mansfield Base Lodge by architect David Freed, 1941. This was a CCC project, and one of the great mysteries of CCC architecture in Vermont is how the heck David Freed slipped not one, but two modernist buildings past Washington, D.C. <laughs> they, there really aren't any other examples nationwide of strongly modernist design in a CCC structure. This one combines some of the rustic log that we tend to associate with the CCC, but then this very dramatic shed-roofed, uh, glass-walled uh, ski lodge right at the base of the mountain uh, where you can sit and relax at the fireplace and look out and, and be seen. Um, really a, an important work in the, the CCC architectural movement. And it's still there today. It, it, it's kind of grown 
wings off it, so it's hard to pick out. Uh, but the, the core building is still there. Likewise, the Crystal Lake Bathhouse in Barton, uh, another David Fried project, very, again, aggressively modern. Big shed roof, ribbon windows. Uh, this is really picking up on some of the international style influence coming into uh, uh, from Europe in the late 1930s. And even though the forms are modern, the materials, it's stone, it's brick, it's board and batten siding, it's basic stuff that the average CCC laborer knew how to use. So they weren't pushing the envelope on materials, uh, just on the style. And this building has recently been uh, really nicely restored by the Vermont State Parks, and it's in great condition today. This is what most people think of for CCC architecture, the big, heavy log construction. And this is another uh, ski shelter at the base of the Middlebury Snowball, uh, built by the CCC in 1938. And this, again, we're the infancy of the ski industry. And this is when you know, a base lodge didn't have a cafeteria, <laughs> didn't have arcades, didn't have entertainment centers. Um, it was pretty much a stove, a fire pit, place to put on your gear, a place to warm up, a place to take off your gear. Now that, that was it. So these space lodges are pretty spartan. Mm. This building is still there. It's in rough shape, really rough shape. Um, it has, in fact, I think there's a plaque on it that says it's the first space lodge ever built in the nation. It's not. It, <laughs> one of the first five, maybe. <laughs> but, um, but really a good example of, of that rustic CCC um, log architecture. Where is it again? It's at the Middlebury Snowball in oh. Hancock, okay. their uh, yeah. Middlebury College ski area. Uh, schools. Um, a lot of schools were uh, targeted for not just basically reconstruction. They, they, this case in Cabot, uh, the village school, this description says that this building replaced a ramshackle one-room you know, falling down, dilapidated, just really made it sound awful. <laughs> and then they got this very nice, uh, proper uh, colonial revival style uh, schoolhouse that really must have had an impact locally uh, to see the government coming in and investing in their community in this way. And not just little rural public schools, University of Vermont, the Southwick Memorial Building, uh, the Women's Gymnasium on the Redstone Campus. Uh, McKim, Mead, and White were the architects for this, the premier architectural firm of the early 20th century, funded with, uh, from the Public Works Administration. And uh, so we have both very you know, small, rural, local buildings and monumental public buildings. and sewage disposal plants. <laughs> Isn't this the most beautiful sewage disposal <laughs> <laughs> This is in St. Albans, a PWA project. I mean, when was the last time you saw striped canvas awnings <laughs> on a sewage plant? <laughs> and, you know, rock-lined pathways, the name ticked out on the <coughs> hillside. I mean, this is, they were really trying to make these infrastructure improvements that a community could be proud of. And I, I don't know if any of this, uh, any of this facility still exists. Um, I haven't broached that subject with the town of St. Albans yet. <laughs> but um, but it's, I think it's a great example of even the most mundane infrastructure was given a lot of care and thought uh, into how it was designed and built. And Tracy Hall. The town hall in Norwich. This is right on the green, Norwich Village. Um, this was also a PWA project, uh, replacing a much smaller, uh, outmoded uh, town hall they had. And again, the colonial revival style, suitable for New England. Uh, there, there was an emphasis on trying to not custom design each building. There's certain styles that are repeated, but make them fit contextually where they were in the nation. So you're not going to find this, this town hall plan in New Mexico. 
you'll find something more suited to New Mexico. Um, it might be repeated around the state and in the Southwest, um, but there is definitely a, a conscious awareness of making sure these buildings kind of made sense to where they were being placed. Now, if you want to know more about these projects, um, three really good sources that I found uh, are the New Deal, a 75th anniversary collection that really emphasizes the art programs along with the writing, pro the Federal Writers Project, uh, the theater project, um, really a good overview to try to sort out how all these programs came into place and work together. Buildings-wise, there's a fantastic book, Long Range Public Investment, Investment, The Forgotten Legacy of the New Deal by Bob Leininger. And it really makes the case for how these New Deal projects, uh, the infrastructure from roads and curbs and sewers to town halls to schools, they really laid the groundwork for the post-war explosion of American wealth and prosperity. And without these projects in the 30s, it may not have turned out uh, as well as it did in the post-war years. And finally, Wall to Wall America, Post Office Murals in the Great Depression. It's a really interesting social history of the, the post office, uh, specific to the post office mural uh, by Carol Ann Marling. And it gets into uh, one of the biggest controversies was actually an artist from Bennington College uh, who painted a mural for a small town in South Carolina and they hated it, and it just, it, it was not good. And that was one of, the, one of the early mural projects and almost kind of threatened to derail the whole thing because this, this mural was just not what they wanted. <laughs> so there's a good story of that in Wall to Wall America. So that's what I have for you tonight. Thank you very much for your interest. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer I was surprised to see that a famous firm like McKim, Mead and White was commissioned to do something mm -hmm. at this time. There were there were a number of ways. Some were federal projects where it was federal plans and workers. Others, it was just the money. So that would have been just a non-federal project, a grant going to UVM. And UVM said, well, we've got plans from McKinney and White for this new gymnasium. We're going to use this money for this project. So, And it, it gets confusing <laughs> trying to tease out a federal project or a non-federal project and who was paying what. And so. so the Union Elementary School here was, I believe, a WPO works progress. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, there is a plaque, but I don't know who uh -huh. the architect is. But it yes. Was, the great thing with the WPA buildings is they always put a plaque on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my job so much easier. <laughs> it's just inside the, it's just okay, inside the main Okay, great. I'll check that out. Um, I do have a list of uh, PWA projects, Public Works Administration yeah. projects. Um, somewhere there's a playground in Montpelier built with PWA funding. It so may be over by the rec. Yeah. Could be. The rec well, that, yeah, that was a CCC project, right. I think. Uh, the, the rec fields and the pool and all that. Yeah. Yep. There was a hydro dam out that way, too, which mm -hmm. was also that. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the amount of in infrastructure is just phenomenal, I mean, from the dams to the recreational facilities. So what was the connection to CCC, between CCC projects and PWA and WPA? I mean, the, I, and they overlapped, right? they, and they used some of the same, you know, they used labor from both in some of those projects. Yeah, that right? yeah that's where it gets mushy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, they were distinct entities, but whether that was on the funding side of things could vary, or the labor side of things, um, so I think there was a lot of, a lot of overlap. Um, and the, the programs tended to run for five or six years usually, and I think the CCC was one of the longest running programs, yeah. so, yeah. Do you know about the reproductions of the St. Albans mural that are in Bellows Falls at a restaurant? They're, oh, they're no. really wonderful. The restaurant is called Popolo, and uh, it's in the main downtown section of Bellows Falls, okay. and the owner um, 
he had to get permission from the federal government and go right. through a whole long process. But he basically had actual size reproductions of those murals made, no. and mm -hmm. they're on either side of the restaurant. They're really beautiful. Oh, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. That's great. The, Food's the, good, the too. Artist is <laughs> And he also has a mural in the entry to the Bellows Falls High School. Yeah, I have not seen that. it, um, but there's another piece by him there. Yeah. Now, do you have a sense of whether the artists were doing these in the studios and then bringing yes. the canvases? Yeah, so they would typically get a an elevation drawing showing this is your, this is what the wall will look like. There'll be a door cut out here. There'll be a bulletin board here. The ceiling height will be this level. And then they could plan their uh, their painting accordingly and do it in the studio and then install it. Yeah. So these weren't, you know, Diego Rivera was doing frescoes. Right. Mm. So he, he was working in situ, you know, doing the work right there on the wall. Um, these were done on campus in the studio and then installed. Is there any record of there having been other murals that have disappeared? Not that I can find. No, as far as um, is from all the records, uh, these are the five that were done and that remain today. There are uh, nationally stories of, you know, the rogue postmaster who hates the picture and mm. paints it beige, <laughs> um, or the you know the building's getting renovated and they carefully remove the mural and it goes in the basement and then 20 years later it's discovered. So um, occasionally. If the building is being torn down, the murals will go to a local art museum. I know there's one at the Portland Art Museum in Maine. Um, but you really lose the whole reason behind the mural when it's in a museum. And the point was to get it out of the museum, <laughs> you know, get it out in the public realm. So. I, I had heard, and maybe this is a topic, that Roosevelt, Franklin, um, Roosevelt was fairly instrumental in making sure that regional styles were represented. I don't he know. Was I don't know for sure. Architectural but historian, mm -hmm. and he was very concerned about mm -hmm. the aesthetic. I certainly wouldn't yes. be surprised if that was, yeah, was the case. Yeah. So a little <clears throat> off the topic because it's not Vermont necessarily, but um, <laughs> it's okay. In California, Diego Rivera did a number of murals mm -hmm. at the Court Tower and some of the other buildings and the uh, Art Institute, I think. I, was were those WPA projects or? I would doubt it. Okay. And I would think those are probably privately commissioned okay. uh, murals. I know he okay. has some at uh, Pomona College, doesn't he? I yeah, I I, I don't know Rivera. all of them, um, but, but but those were those were so political. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, those were yeah. those were really outside. Well, <laughs> and wasn't he a Mexican national? Yeah, and so that to hire him to the program right. works project would right. be a little yeah. Unique. This was really focused on you know, American artists. Yeah, promoting yeah. Their, their work. Oh, yes, yeah. it's a rose yeah. fresco, uh, yeah. and it's in the hallway, so you can't really see it all in one piece. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's a hallway in the library, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. The um, cabin that's at Milkberry yes. Noble, you said it was in pretty poor shape. Yes. Is there any move to restore it, or is there any interest? <laughs> is, it, is it on college property? It yeah. College yeah. Property. Oh, it is. Uh huh. And I think it's just one of those things, it's not a priority. Um, colleges, universities have so many buildings to manage. This little log cabin off on the side of the parking lot at the Snow Bowl, it's not really rising to the top of the list. Um, it would be great if they did, because it is a very early. Um, CCC project and that direct link to the early ski industry I think is gives it even more significance um, but the the base logs are rotting out the whole thing is tilting so the Vermont um, ski area associations <laughs> yeah I have some interest mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now, you yep. mentioned Paul Sample 
Yes. Because he did the National Life Mural, but that's much later. Yes. Did he stick around? I mean, he started with with the Works Project murals and then. Yeah, yeah, he did quite a bit of, of mural work, um, and I don't know if you know the National Life Mural is gone. Yeah, it's, it's going to the historical yes. though, right? Yeah. I work in the National Life Building, and I miss seeing that mural every day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But what did he not some photographs, oh. uh, something. Mm -hmm. it, it, not a not a suitable place. replacement. Just yeah. <laughs> painted over. Really, oh. yeah. Well, they removed the painting, and it's going to Vermont Historical Society, so it will go back on public display. Is there a question? What was the public reaction to the murals? Was it generally positive when they were revealed to the public at the time? I think it really react? depended on the amount of public involvement from the outset. Um, if there was input from the public and the artist working together to figure out, okay, what's what's important to the history of your town? What what do you want to see here? That would certainly have a more welcome reaction than uh, the one for Aiken, South Carolina, where the artist showed up with it. They didn't even know he was doing it. <laughs> and put it up, and the judge said, "I can't look at that," and put curtains over it. <laughs> so, uh, but I think generally they were well received. We had a presentation here on theater curtains. Yeah. Um, there's a group that's, you know, replenished sure. all the theater curtains. And what interests me is there's, you've got, we've only got five murals, but we have all these theater curtains that are of similar themes and and treatments and so forth. So that it seems like Vermont towns did something a little bit different in terms of um, na remembering their history and. Yeah, the theater curtains are a great example yeah. of public. Art, you know, that I hadn't thought of. That that's a good a good Some example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, it's very.